poke some fun at the A-line train, but you know what? The A-line has never fallen into a gaping chasm in the earth, and we can no longer say the same about US 36 between Denver and Boulder. So give me a late train over a highway with a house-sized hole any day. CDOT says it is not just the highway, it's the earth underneath. And the problem is you need both of them to stay put or else you have a crack that becomes a gap, that becomes a crater, that becomes a canyon. CDOT says the foundation and the retaining wall are shifting at an inch an hour. So it is a slow-moving disaster playing out on 36 at Church Ranch Boulevard in Westminster. They can't repair it while it's still sliding, so at this point, they're just turning their attention to the westbound lanes, hoping to divert some eastbound traffic over there by Wednesday morning. Shift happens, and we will get to how in just a moment. But first, something that several of you asked our next team today. Karen, Jane, and a bunch of others reached out to ask our next question. Will the private company that owns US 36 and profits from our tolls, are they going to pay for the fix? It's like an eye test. That was the, the, the print was like that big. Uh, the company that operates US 36 is from Australia. Plenary Roads paid for the second half of the expansion, and in return, they get to keep our express tolls on all of 36. So Steve Steger is poking around today asking if Plenary is going to have to pay for the repairs. And Steve found out we may actually have to pay them. It's quite clear CDOT doesn't want to talk about who's going to pay the bill for this mess. It took them three hours to send me a generic statement this afternoon when I asked them about it. And then they shut down reporters' questions about it this afternoon. And we, we, we will get to those issues and those questions, but not today. Under their agreement with CDOT, Plenary Roads built half of the expansion of US 36, the part well west of where this crack occurred. A spokesman for the company told me that Plenary had nothing to do with the design or construction of that area. So it's likely CDOT will be the one responsible for the repairs there. And CDOT's fiscal responsibilities may not stop there. This is where things get interesting. Under Plenary's contract with the state, CDOT may have to reimburse Plenary for lost toll revenue if the toll lane is closed for more than 12 hours. CDOT has had the eastbound toll lane closed for much longer than that, and the agency plans to shift eastbound traffic into the westbound toll lane until the repairs are complete. So it's likely that a large portion of toll lanes could be closed for a long time. Neither side will say now whether CDOT will have to pay up. So we asked CDOT today for an idea of the average toll revenue for a given day. They are still working on that for us. And Kyle, here's another interesting wrinkle in all of this. Mm -hmm. If you look at the contract, it says that CDOT can temporarily order the road closed, then they're fine. Okay. But if they temporarily suspend those lanes, that's when they have to pay up. So it really matters the semantics that they're using here at this time. Very interesting. So that, that's going to depend on whether or not they have to reimburse that toll revenue. So, so which is the one that doesn't cost us money? Temporarily to to the order. <laughs> Tem temporarily order. Temporarily order. So okay. it, just if anybody asks, yeah, you temporarily ordered it. Yep. Very yeah. good. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. The Bureau of Land Management is moving to Colorado, Grand Junction specifically. Republican Senator Cory Gardner made the announcement. He's been pushing for this for a while. He says that decisions about the West should be made in the West. The Public Lands Foundation notes that those federal employees for the BLM, they're here already. Only 3% of BLM employees work in Washington. And the Public Lands Foundation said moving those budget and oversight personnel away from D.C. might actually hurt the agency. Mayor Michael Hancock's third and final term begins just as the last one ended. Heckled and booed, but still standing and still in charge. Hancock's inauguration was like some kind of endurance test in the noonday heat and sun today on those unshaded steps of the city and county building. Hancock's speech sounded some of the progressive themes that his critics often say that his policies do not address. Hancock did signal in some of his strongest terms yet that the city government is willing to insert itself into the housing market. An affordable home is the social foundation that any family's economic security is built on. The American dream should be a dream for all. And when the market refocuses or refuses to respond, we must step in to ensure that it becomes an attainable reality for all of Denverites. 
You know how tough it is to focus when somebody's shouting at you like you? I can't hear all of you shouting because you're in your living rooms. After the inauguration, it was picture day for the five new city council members. Remember when they would have school picture day on like the hottest day in the spring? It's just the worst. And the day did not get any better for the new council members. After pictures, they had to take questions from our Marshall Zellinger. The number one issue facing Denver is what? Lack of affordability, cost of living. A true understanding of equity. I'd say lack of affordability. Relationship between land use and transit infrastructure. Lack of affordability. There's a theme with the five new Denver City Council members. Amanda, another Amanda, Chris, Candy, and Jamie. There's a camaraderie here for all of us who are brand new at this. You have people here who were forced to run because of the conditions in our city. And we're, I think there's more adults in the room. People feel disenfranchised. People feel that their voice is not being heard and they feel like they were disregarded. People don't feel like they're heard. I think even there's a conversation that will be in our first city council meeting tonight. At that meeting, they'll have their first big decision, along with the other eight existing members of city council. They'll vote on the $94 million expansion of Pena Boulevard to and from DIA, a decision that would impact a community outside of the Denver city limits. So when we are talking about decisions that are related to the airport, we, are, we have to take not only other counties in the state of Colorado into consideration, but also people who are potentially driving here or whatever from other states. A decision looming over this new council will be the fate of Park Hill Golf Course, sold last week to a developer. These five showed a loud allegiance through their silence. The city believes it has contractually that that piece of land always has to have an 18-hole golf course. Do you think 18-hole golf course should remain where Park Hill Golf Course currently is. No one raised their hand. How many think it should be developed? No one raised their hand. That could make for some awkward city council meetings that might be worthwhile to go cover, knowing that that will be over the next year or two with the developer who paid a lot of money for something that they probably want developed, Kyle. Uh, an interesting moment in that interview is when I asked if Mayor Hancock had reached out to all of them. Four of the five said they had personal meetings with Mayor Hancock. You'll have to tune in tomorrow to find out which one didn't because we're also going to show you some of their answers on advice they have for Mayor Hancock in his final term. Wait, wait, wait. He, he met with all of them? He didn't meet with one of them? He didn't meet with one of them. I, I could give you five guesses. You're only going to need one. <laughs> I, I think I can guess. Marshall, thank you. Hey, speaking of, Lisa Calderon made it to City Hall. She lost the mayoral race, but she won a job as chief of staff for new city councilwoman Candy Cidabaca. Cidabaca told us that she and Lisa Calderon agree on a lot of issues, but she is there to focus on her priorities. I picked Lisa specifically because I knew that she stood for what I believe in and will stand behind me and help me serve our community. I am fully capable of making my decisions, always have, always will, and my staff is committed to supporting those decisions. One thought as Mayor Hancock and the New Look City Council embark on four more years of leading this city. I tend to think that we in the media might have made too much or at least suggested that more is going to change than actually will. Mayor Hancock goes from having an almost entirely compliant city council to a majority compliant city council. And with Denver's strong mayor system, the mayor and his appointees, they have got a lot of sway. And if he continues to have just a majority on council, well, then that rubber stamp is not about to run out of ink. What will change? is that the mayor's critics now have a platform to outline what they would do differently if they were in charge. But they're not. Not yet, anyway. One last note on the change at City Hall. Councilman Chris Hines is literally preparing the, other, uh, the way for others to follow after him. It's an accessibility ramp added to the dais. He's the first city councilman to use a wheelchair. And today he thanked the folks at City Hall for making sure it'll be a smooth transition. Those reported mass roundups by immigration agents over the weekend did not happen as anticipated. The Colorado Rapid Response Network, which advocates for people in this country illegally, says it received only a few calls on Sunday. It's when the targeted enforcement was supposed to happen. The initiative has a hotline where people can call in if they think that they've seen ICE activity. They went to check on reports out of uh, Breckenridge and Denver. Nothing confirmed here. The group working to repeal the national popular vote law says it has enough signatures to get that on the 2020 ballot. They're talking about their internal verification process, 
which counts about 150,000 signatures. They need 124,000 and change. At last count, they say they have 187,000 total. What does that mean? It means chances are all of Colorado will weigh in on Democrats' idea to join the National Popular Vote Compact. This is a story that we've told here before. Drivers and rocks continue their dance in Colorado. Jerry Molhauser snapped this photo in Littleton of a car that tried to go to a drive up ATM off Kipling and instead an off road adventure. Spoiler alert the bowlers always win. The target rock always won. That was the first and most popular of the rocks that we've chronicled across our area, including that time. Somebody high centering right in front of our camera at Colorado Mills Target in Lakewood. After this went on TV, the mall moved the rock to a retirement lot out back. The spot where US 36 is crumbling was the site of another disaster. But a geologist says there is another issue to blame. You can't dig anywhere around Denver without finding something fascinating. And it's been that way for a while. And an eight year old with a message. I would say to all the other people who have Tourette's that you can overcome them. Did we mention our eight-year-old is also a filmmaker? His story is next. A few of you today, including Peter and Wigan, sent us notes that the collapsing part of US 36 near Church Ranch Boulevard is the same spot where two trains collided under the overpass in 1985. Terrible fire and crash. Five people were killed. Now, the current bridge, the area that we're looking at, is not at that exact spot. It's just nearby. And the issue now, according to a geologist at Mines, is really about the earth underneath. You know, my personal opinion is we had a whole bunch of rain, it's been hot, we get a bunch of rain, it's been hot, and dries out, and just some of those materials just tend to, to fail, and that's, that's part of living where we live and building on, on, on things like that. Matt Morgan is with the Colorado Geological Survey at the Colorado School of Mines. He says if you're looking, if you're looking way, way back, what's now part of Colorado was once a deep water seascape, and then it became more of a flowing river area in ancient history. So it has this mud-like material, and it's prone to exactly what we are seeing now, the shifting and the sinking. <laughs> Thunder showers to cool us after another hot day with temperatures in the 90s. A couple of severe cells to the north and south of the city and up high, a beautiful panorama and some heavy rain for travel on I-70. 92 today, the average is 90. We'll see these numbers steadily increase throughout the week. Tracking another wave of showers that may roll off of the foothills, so a brief rain shower, a little thunder and lightning still likely here in the city. Severe weather to the north of us, all of this moisture wrapping around high pressure centered to the east, and this is the remnants of Barry creating some flooding that extends all the way up through Memphis and St. Louis, where we may see airport delays. Not expecting airport delays tonight or tomorrow, but a little lightning out around DIA in the next two hours, a possibility. Skies clear overnight. We get a sunny day tomorrow and another warm day with about a 20% chance that we'll see storms that might actually bring some rain. 63 with clearing skies overnight. Tomorrow, hot highs back in the 90s. Grab every raindrop you can because Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we have 95 to 100 degrees. Hot and dry heading into the weekend, but the Cloud cover does make for a pretty sunset. Uh, Kyle, this one from Carson Jones. Thank you, Kathy. All right, let's take another little trip into random Colorado history. You know, typically it's Jeremy Hohola who's digging through Denver Public Library archives to find our nuggets. Today, something not quite as old, at least in terms of its discovery, but still pretty interesting. It was this day in 2002 when something truly old was unearthed. In a road excavation project near the Stonegate subdivision in Parker, they found the partial remains of a mammoth. Yeah, there's no mistake in that. Estimated to have lived here about 200,000 years ago, they carefully extracted and preserved 28 pieces of mammoth, and some of them, including that big tusk, you can see at the Parker Town Hall lobby. Highlands Ranch, as you likely know, is digging up its own ancient animal right now. Work that continues because they keep finding more bits of Triceratops at the site near C-470 in Santa Fe. A team from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science have been working since mid-May, and they think they have about 30% of the dinosaur, including a partial rib. If they can come up with 200 or so bones, they'll have the entire sucker. And there have been some spectacular fossils found in our state over the years. A rare fish fossil from southeastern Colorado, the world's first stegosaurus, was dug up in Morrison. And one of the most complete torosaurus skeletons, that's like a triceratops, came out of Thornton. Denver police had a cool idea today's hot inauguration. I'm not saying it's a trap, but it might be a trap. Calling this eight-year-old a short film producer isn't a joke. He just hasn't done long pieces yet. 
It was fun just being surprised that I won the film festival. He's a young man who didn't let his challenges overshadow his talent. That's next. I want to update you on Brighton's big water fight. We've been telling you how people in town are mad about the potential firing of the city manager because they think it's to cover up $70 million in overbilling for water. We just learned while we were on the air here that a recall effort against the mayor, Ken Kreitzer, has been approved. They need to come up with 1,150 signatures in 60 days to do it. There's a big meeting tomorrow night where the city manager might get fired, and the people trying to do the recall think they're going to get a bunch of the signatures right there. A filmmaker from Arvada is making the film Festival Circuit, as many do. Gabriel Gianquinto's latest film, Tire Swing, just won American University's eco-comedy video competition. I should mention that Gabriel is eight. He sort of specializes in conquering challenges. I love to build Legos. Gabriel Giaquinto wants to travel into space someday. First, I'd like to go to the moon. Mm. For now, he's producing and directing his own scenario with Legos and his vivid imagination. This usually flies to volcanoes to drop the bad things in. But his talents as a producer and director have also given him an opportunity to win some awards for his work. Can't be more proud. If you look here. Awards for films. I mean, not be his last award won in June. It was fun just being surprised that I won the film festival because I don't usually win things. But it's not the awards that make Gabriel's story so interesting. Did you want to talk about your Tourette's? Mm. Well, they're not really much of a problem. Tourette's syndrome. At just six years old, Gabriel was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome. To me, it's like when my brain wants me to do certain movements, and if I don't do them, I really get annoyed. So when an email came to Gabriel's mom, the family got together to make a film, which has opened up some doors. For us, this is just life, coming together as a family and making a really fun project to help educate other people. But it was also amazing to watch him overcome everything and grow through the process. Now this eight-year-old is playing with Legos and making short films. Not bad. Soon, maybe he'll swing into space. Who knows? To all the other people who have Tourette's, that you can overcome them because nature doesn't usually give you a problem that you can't overcome. That was the work of our own Tom Cole who went out to meet Gabriel. The bummer about the awards though, they put the wrong name on one and the wrong title on the other as Tom Cole said, welcome to the big time kid. Gabriel's getting some new plaques. Spotted a genius idea by Denver police out on the streets today at Mayor Hancock's inauguration in the sunshine. A free popsicle truck. Copsicles, they call them. Step right up and enjoy a free popsicle from police. I will say of all of the various DNA collection methods I've seen, this has got to be one of the slicker ones. Just remember, if you take a free popsicle from Denver police, you are under no obligation to answer their questions while you enjoy it. And whatever you do, take the popsicle stick with you when you're done. Your feedback is next. You get the last word as always. And a gentleman on Twitter who goes by Falcon says, remember when there was Phil the sinkhole on I-25 a few years back? I think it was Gary Shapiro and Greg Moss who named that big hole Phil the sinkhole. Well, this guy writes in and says, what shall we name the crack on US 36? Hit me up at the hashtag hey next or use the email next at 9 newscom if you have a suggested name for the crack in US 36. And B. Dalton writes in during tonight's program and says, is Kyle Clark leaving 9 News? Not that I know of yet, B. Thanks for the heads up. See you next time.